everyone for uh, popping on. Uh, Burnt, thank you so much for playing live music. That was a really unexpected surprise that we just can't thank you enough. I for. know. No, I know. Listen, I'm happy to do it. Uh, I appreciate you guys giving me the the uh, platform to do, you know, to, to really uh, show my talent. I, you know, people think we're going to be talking about Web3, but I'm really mm -hmm. in for the last minute pivot to making this an abstract jazz conversation. I will be very honest with you. When you when you sent uh, the agenda, uh, I, I don't think I've ever actually followed an agenda on an AMA in my entire life. So I, I could totally do this. Uh, similar to modern jazz theory, right? We could improv this whole thing. All right, we're gonna have to come back on. Uh, I'll I'll get our improv troupe up to speed and ready to go. I don't. Roland over here sending me messages on Slack, being like, "Nah, man, I can't do improv. Classical Shakespearean <laughs> all day, but we can't. We're not rolling with improv. Too much structure. No, I get it. I get it. You're a structured kind of man. Right, I, I was well, just saying, I I didn't even know there was an agenda, so uh, I'm not sure what Ant Man's talking about here. <laughs> All right, we are very serious people representing a very serious industry. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. We've got Burnt from Zion and Roland here on the Agoric side, and we're going to talk about chain abstraction and how it's going to help make Web3 consumer ready. Um, you know, what we're going to do, we're going to have our speakers introduce themselves, talk a little bit about what their projects are, why they think chain abstraction is important, and then we're going to dive into our big talking points. Um, I'm going to give a quick overview of what chain abstraction is just so we're all on the same page and then after that we you know we'll kick it off and we'll dive we'll dive in um you know so just so everyone kind of has this the same idea of where we are uh, we're talking about chain abstraction and which it's uh it's an idea that's gaining a lot of popularity recently um that users should not have to interact directly with their blockchains right as a design philosophy it's really uh focused on improving the user experience by enabling seamless interactions with all the different tokens and platforms and apps that you as a person want to use on different chains without having to use a thousand different applications. Uh, all in all, everyone seems really excited for it. Really cool idea. And we're really happy to be talking with teams who are talking about uh, chain abstraction and thinking about it today. So without further ado, Bert, bring us in. Tell us a little bit about Zion and why you think chain abstraction is so important. Hell yeah. Um... Cool. Zion obviously working as one of the key players in the chain abstraction space along with the core. And I think it's the only way that we reach mainstream adoption. I think uh, Web3 is way too technically complex and has insane barriers to entry. And uh, I think the only way to actually reach users is to kind of go to them. Right on. Roland, give us a quick overview. What is uh, what is Agoric and what are, why do you think chain abstraction is important? Sure. Uh, yeah. So thanks for having me. Welcome, uh, everybody. Uh, Agoric is a layer one chain that is built for smart contracts in JavaScript and uniquely uh, enables what we call orchestration, which is our approach to how we let developers build for a chain abstracted world. And really what that means is as an Agoric smart contract, when you talk to other contracts or talk to other chains, you send messages and await a reply. That reply could happen in the same block or it could happen 21 days later, like if you're unstaking or something like that. And what that what that means really just at a high level is for developers, it will be significantly easier to build applications and contracts that speak cross chain on Agoric um, than anywhere else as a result of sort of the native async capability uh, and the, the orchestration capabilities that we're about to launch. And so that's that's really our approach to chain abstraction. And we're, we're really excited to, to be launching in the next couple months here. Sweet. Awesome. All right. So um, really great uh, high level intros to both projects. And uh, you know, I'm really excited to kind of hear a bit more about how these different approaches work and dive into how they might even end up working together. Um, so uh, just for those of us, uh, I mean, I totally spent a lot of time reading the burnt docs and every page on your website. <laughs> so I, you know, I know everything, but Absolutely. for the other people who might not those have spent, don't know. <laughs> of course, uh, tell us a little bit about like what you know, like what um, what Zion got going on. What is what's like what's the product and uh, what is your approach to making chain abstraction more accessible? Totally, I think that's. Uh... You know, and I appreciate you know the hours and hours of research that you did, um, you know, on that. But uh, someone has with to. That, yeah, I mean, someone's gotta, right? Um, you know, we need we need more people like you in the world. That being said, I think you know it's funny because chain abstraction is such an interesting word 
where it, like a lot of things in crypto, it means everything and nothing at the same time. Um, I think when we think chain abstraction, like I would say that in the way that like orchestration works, I think that's one piece of the puzzle, uh, you know, and I think, you know, the way that we kind of work with it is very similar, you know, obviously utilizing inner chain accounts, if anyone's familiar with the IBP protocol, uh, in order to kind of, uh, you know, be able to say, hey, not only should, should you not know what chain you're working on, taking that a little bit step forward and saying, you shouldn't really even need to know that you're interacting with crypto at all. You know, our goal is to create a complete Web2 experience with credit card, debit card, you know, uh, if you want, uh, you know, obviously still being able to use EUSDC and ETH or whatever, um, you know, but I think for us, when we think, when we think abstraction, that's kind of all that we think about. And so whether that be uh, abstracted interop, which is very similar to what I would think orchestration is, um, or, you know, gas abstraction, uh, fee abstraction, uh, Effectively, everything on our chain is a smart contract account, so we're able to very seamlessly communicate everywhere. Um, it's a very long-winded approach, uh, or answer, I should say, for just answering the simple question of, we just want to abstract all crypto away. Why would you say something so controversial, yet so yet brave? Yet so brave! <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, I mean, I think you, you've said something that really that really sticks out to me, and I hear a lot of people talk, bring up in these chain abstraction conversations, and which is, I think, particularly kind of wild and interesting, that you're like, we want to recreate Web 2 experiences in Web 3. And, you know, you're seeing a lot of, or at least I'm hearing a lot of people who are referring back to, like, you know, we using Web 2 as a model, which is not what I expected to hear from people building crypto products, you know? Yeah, I mean, listen, uh, people, like, I don't know, I was talking to, like, my grandmother the other day, and she's like, listen, I just started using this online banking and stopped using checks. And I'm like, that's where we fucking are? Like, in, in, the, in the process of everything, I'm like, I just bought, like, X amount of, like, pussy and bio token. I'm like, damn, and you're still paying your bank account with checks. But, like, what I'm saying is there's, we need, like, there's such a bigger world out there. And, like, very unfortunately, crypto will always consistently be capped by wallets, right? The, mm -hmm. And I think that's kind of this, this first and foremost thing, which the friction and the knowledge is so freaking high for new users. Um, you know, and you also get this whole thing of, you know, you're not really in crypto until you get rug pulled. Like, that shouldn't be a fucking thing. Like, yeah. that just shouldn't be. That's not how we, we need to operate in, uh, in in kind of reaching these next, you know, million users or whatever. And so it's it's people are very used to a Web2 experience. Um, and, and it's simple, right? Like, it's been worked on for the last, you know, 20 or so years, like, good crypto, I mean, good Web2 UI. And so it's it's not only is it, like, functional barriers, but it's also knowledge barriers that really keep people out. And especially as we were in a bear market and no one fucking trusted crypto, you kind of really just got to go to the end user. Yeah, I'm totally with you. I was talking to my grandmother the other day and she was looking at the docs for Uniswap V4 and was like, I oh, just yeah? don't get why XY plus K is such a big thing. It oh, really, yeah. it, it's not user friendly. It really, like, really is Are we just going to call hooks intense? Like, is that what we're doing here? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, so I, I, can you tell me a little bit, like, what was the, what was the inspiration to build Zion and to like create this platform? Yeah. Um, I was originally building early, early Solana days. Um, you know, obviously very before that I, I lit a Banksy on fire and turned it into an NFT, hence the name Burn Banksy. Uh, and then I, for a little while I was building early Solana. So, uh, was Metaplex from the first NFT standard and then built the first collection standard over there. Uh, and was building one of the first decentralized NFT marketplaces. Um, and man, is that an uphill battle building a product? And you kind of look around, you look at like even the top 100 coins on coin market cap. I mean, you probably pick out a handful of things that are not like that are actual projects, not just pure infrastructure plays. Um, you know, and it was fine in a bull market, but when a bear market came, you know, there was three users in crypto. And on, on that kind of crash, you kind of then realize, which is like, wow. This is going to continue being extremely cyclical until we can actually onboard people and the process doesn't take days and it doesn't take, uh, you know, extreme knowledge barriers. And I think the main thing that crypto is using is, is, is it feels like a lot of the products here are A, huge value capture funnel, and then B, fighting over scraps. And I think you can kind of feel this when it's like this airdrop game of L2, L2, CDL pump, uh, you know, swapping for farming. 
uh, because there's not really much new, and there's not really many right. new users, um, and there's not much new capital coming in aside from like Bitcoin ETF. And so I think the real next problem that needs to be solved, I think before we can really see any innovation on the application side, is the ability to actually onboard users and to provide a good experience that doesn't have like a, a 4% uh, user capture rate. Yeah, and I mean, that is honestly a perfect transition into uh, bringing Roland up to talk a little bit about our approach to this. It's almost as if we coordinated ahead of time. Yeah, um, like we orchestrated, <laughs> if you would. Oh, he said it! <laughs> I, and, um, and I but, guess uh, before, but yeah, before I talk about Agoric, I, I guess I just want to say I couldn't agree more with with everything I just heard. You know, it, it's I I'm someone that's pretty deep in this space. You know, I'm I've been a heavy DeFi user since DeFi summer, and and even I, when I'm trying to like move assets across chain, I end up with the wrong thing on the wrong side, and I'm like trying to <laughs> trade something with super low liquidity, and it's like fuck, I just spent. Two hundred dollars in fees to get here, and yeah. now it's not even and the thing I want. Now you have your wallet to yeah. resend it back. <laughs> I know, and, and it's like this. You know, I I'm probably in the top one percent of like knowledgeable crypto users, and this still happens to me. Like this, this cannot be the the world that we live in still in in a couple of years because really the, the space will die without without yeah. a, a new innovation. And I also fully agree that there there really has felt like this this cycle. There just hasn't been the kind of zero to one stuff that we saw last cycle with DeFi with NFTs coming in for the first time. It's, it's just kind of a lot of those same recycled ideas. And so, you know, I, I think, I think that zero to one leap really does need to be in mainstream onboarding. And as you said, there's, there are a few components to this that need to come together to make it work. And one of them is seamless um, asset onboarding with, whether that's fiat or management of crypto um, and, you know, you, you guys are, are working there, account, you know, account abstraction, having universal accounts that can can reach across chains and then the user doesn't necessarily need to know what's happening underneath. And then, yeah, on our side, it's about the, the decentralized connectivity and making those those accounts that reach across chains, giving them the kinds of capabilities that feel like the same the same app on the same chain that we interact with today and, and allowing that composability across different chains, different assets. Um, and in a space where the the user shouldn't really have to know for the most part what's underlying the the networks they're working on, but but those choices still do matter, right? You know, you still and, and especially as like a, a relatively technical person, like I I think about the security trade offs that of, of the chains I'm working on, but most users not only won't want to do that, they won't be capable of doing that. And so yeah. what you really want is the ability for developers to build these kinds of these kinds of applications and make those choices largely on behalf of their users so users are still building still working in a decentralized ecosystem still able to sort of access their assets through multiple front ends all the things we love about crypto but don't have to have to spend the pain to manage their own resources if they don't want to um, and so that's that's really like you know I, I love seeing different projects coming at the same problem from different angles and solving different pieces of it. Cause I, the, it's the thing that starts to get me excited about, okay, maybe in the next year we will see some real, real breakout things because that's the sort of thing we need for that. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I obviously, I, I, I couldn't agree more, uh, you know, and, and I think it's super exciting when, when, cause it's, everyone knows it's a problem. Right. And I, and I think like, it's funny, we were talking, we had this conversation internally, especially if we like, we're talking about something like gas fees, which is, you know, I, I think in, in hopefully five years, but I think the idea of a gas fee is just kind of going to go away and it'll be very similar to how Web2 projects front an AWS bill, right? And I think as we continue to lower everything like that, um, you know, ideally, and I, and I think like, it's easy, right? Using Web2 as a model is, is very easy because it's also, you know, the less people have to deviate from their norm, um, the better it is. And I think, tr like, what we see a lot with a lot, of, a lot of the projects that build on us is you kind of take the solutionism away when you remove crypto, in a way, right? There's obviously still going to be, like, I want this but Web3, and it's like, well, that's stupid. Um, but, you know, I, I think when you take the selling point of it being Web3 away, you actually get rather interesting innovation where you get, like, true online, you know, try, trying to capture true online value in a decentralized way without it mattering to someone who cares. 
that makes right. sense. Yeah, you start focusing on solving real problems um, exactly. because you know, like, you know, this plus Web three is not actually something that most users give a crap about. Uh, uh, right. about right? <laughs> yeah. no, so, like, honestly, nobody gives a shit that Netflix uses Postgres or Cassandra. They choose Netflix over Hulu because it suits their immediate content need, right? Like, yeah. no one's making that decision based on their on their database. Um, yeah, They're like, oh, and, you and, use Kubernetes? Yeah, which, well, absolutely. This is why I, I use it. <laughs> right. I mean, I, I, you know, we, we often talk about the database example. I think of it more like, you know, do, do I care how my packets get routed or what internet yeah. backbone provider I'm using to get to, you know, some, some destination? No. And, and Web2 got what the web got built that way because users didn't care and they were solving problems that, yeah. So, so, okay. Ant-Man, you asked me about Agoric. And so from, from my side, <laughs> <Yeah>. um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I, so I, I kind of talked a little bit at a high level about what Agoric contracts do and what orchestration can provide for this world, but I can be a little bit more concrete on a use case. Um, and this is something that we see when we talk to a lot of the folks that are doing cross-chain stuff, primarily in the Cosmos ecosystem right now, um, it, where if if you look at the existing cross-chain apps like IBC.fun or Squid or, or any of these sort of um, cutting edge well, apps. Just only swap, but yeah, that's fine. <laughs> yeah, I, and but but I think that there's sort of a a reason for that, right? It's like very very difficult to do things that extend beyond transfer and swap, and and so we we were talking with uh you know I'll, I'll just say one of these teams, and and the thing they were trying to do was a particular kind of bridge transfer, then an IBC bridge, and then one operation after that. And they couldn't do it because the, the bridging protocol they were using didn't allow them to send the right messages across, basically no metadata at all. And so the message lost all its context as soon as it got there. And, you know, this is this is the cutting edge of, of cross-chain yeah. operations. This is, and, we're putting bleeding in bleeding edge. Yeah, yeah exactly. And so <laughs> – Literally. Like, <laughs> so, well, like you look at the state of current cross-chain apps, and they're really, really basic. And it's not because developers are stupid. It's not because like nobody oh. knows this is a problem. It's because you just can't build the shit. And so, what what Agoric is able to provide is a contract structure where you can string it and just like it, we can do a lot more complex stuff than this. But the the low hanging fruit here really is just I want to do four different operations in a row, and I don't want to have to sign more than one transaction. Full stop. Like that. That is something you can very easily do on Agoric that just doesn't exist yet. Um, and so. And do that's, you guys expand outside of but, IBC? Is that is that is that pretty inclusive to IBC or is that uh, everything? I mean. Yeah. So the the short answer there is yes. Um, so the first application that's building and will launch is you know using Axlar to get to EVM. Um, we expect to be connecting to Hyperlane, which will do probably nice. Sol Solana. You know the the modular ecosystem, all yeah, that yeah, stuff, yeah, yeah. and. And yeah, as, as we think about expanding this, it's basically like which ecosystems can we reach? Um, IBC yep. provides a nice uniform infrastructure for like ICAs, ICQs. Like we, we have sort of a, a common way to talk to different chains and ask mm -hmm. and, and perform certain actions. And so it becomes very easy for IBC connected chains. Beyond IBC, it, it will sort of be like, okay, what messages can we actually pass with this route? Um, how can we create an account? Can we get balance transfer notifications? All this like technical stuff we need to figure All out. All the fun stuff. But you know that's that's sort of what we're doing, right? And so yeah. o over the course after our first launch, which should come in the next three or four weeks uh, for Orchestration Core, we're immediately looking to have our, our API start to cover. Axlar, Union, Hyperlane, you know, all, oh, all nice. the core yeah, like yeah. transfer capabilities to get to different ecosystems beyond IBC. Love that. Love that. Yeah, I, I think we're taking a similar a similar approach, but I think where we look at a lot of that is through inner chain accounts. And so like I think um, kind of – I think we had like two, three weeks ago something with Injective, which was being able to use Vitalis NFT marketplace through Zion. Uh, on Injective, which was like I think we had like three hundred thousand uh, IBC channels created, and it was it was funny because it was just people in in the audience can can probably attest. Uh, we had a lot of problems with uh, with, with with effectively like slowing IBC down to a halt <laughs> and hitting like the hard the the hard coded the hard coded, uh, the, the hard -coded uh, limits of Hermes relay. It was uh, definitely a lot of fun, but you know I, I'm excited for what you guys are doing and like. I think there's a lot of ways that we can work together because it's the thing that's really awesome about, I would say, 
every project that I talk to with chain abstraction or, uh, you know, kind of everything like that is it, it finally also feels like the first time uh, that there's genuine, like, need for composability uh, right. or wanting yep. for composability, uh, which is like, hey, we don't fucking care. Um, and that's beautiful. Like, that's how it should be, which is, you know, it's not, you know, you, you know, you could say you're an L1 and you're not competing. You're not, you know, like, I think I saw, I think Mert uh, from Solana posted, uh, you know, a, a thing yesterday, which is like from Aptos. Which was like a, a it was a, a job post that was effectively looking for people to bring over Solana projects, and that's how the industry has felt. It's been very cutthroat. It's been very dog eat dog or winner take all. And I think when you get past that hurdle of the, like Solana users or Aptos users or Agoric or Zion, you get this genuinely like in my mind beautiful, um, like beautiful competition in a way where it's more about fighting for better products like more users than it is of like just a pure rat race and i and i'm i'm very very excited for that future and not this kind of like oh you need to airdrop to these people because you need to steal solana users or you need to steal I mean, like, we're, users. we're legitimately just rehypothecating the same community over and over again to different blockchains yeah, right like it's they're all just like liquid staked people you know at this yeah, point it's the um, same person it's, it's one person and, with like 18 different accounts Right. And we're, I think people are starting to realize that, like, you know, when you look at if you when you talk about the sum total of like Solana users or Cosmos users or Ethereum users, like these are not completely separate circles. They are no. extremely overlapping Venn diagrams, you know, and like, you know, like it, it, the, the conversations that we're having, you know, people like like so many projects are thinking about the same things. And it's really cool to be like, oh, you're thinking about that. We're thinking about that, too. And there's a level of coordination where, you know, within the industry that, I mean, for me, is really exciting to see. Yeah. No, and, and, and it's like, it's it's not only exciting, but I'm, I'm, I'm genuinely excited for, like, product innovation, which is, hey, this is now, you know, we're now omni-chain in a way, right? So now it's less about, like, having, it's, it's less about being the NFT marketplace or the swap or the DEX or the xyz tvl increasing protocol on xyz new chain it's now about hey this is new this is interesting we have the users where this is now a viable business model totally agree and, and so you know i i think the the days honestly the the mainstream adoption of crypto is not going to happen in a way where it, it, it's like tribal and you know a third of people go to the ethereum ecosystem yeah. and a third of people like that that's just like this is early stage crap that's it's happening right now. It's not modular versus monolith. Like that's right. not what my grandmother cares about. <laughs> and, yeah, like it, you know, and, and the adoption pathway is going to be different, right? Like I think a lot yeah. of our adoption pathway has been: I buy a certain asset, and then I go check out all the things that that asset enables me to do. And as soon as, as soon as, it, like I, I look at the Cosmos ecosystem, and again, the fact that it's small kind of makes this maybe not a great example, but I still think about like for the the users of stargaze and the users of osmosis are pretty much the same people and they don't really view those things as fundamentally all that different like it's the same wallet it's the same you know if i want to move assets it's a deposit button and it takes six seconds like that is sort of as ibc extends as better crossing bridging protocols extend like it's going to feel like that all over crypto and all of a sudden this tribalism that's been like locked into a network effect for a specific blockchain just like won't be a thing like that's that's fundamentally what i believe and so it, it for us it's about how do we compose in a world where that that is going to be true and then for you know how do builders build for end users that actually care about solving a problem outside of just like okay i'm locked in with a certain kind of asset what do i do with it um, and I think, you know, I, I think that's the change that's coming and I, and that's why I'm excited. And, and yeah, as you say, like, I love seeing other projects that are doing similar things. The world outside of crypto is so much bigger than the world in crypto. And so fighting, fighting amongst chains seems like You're the dumbest thing to me. Yeah, You're exactly. Like who, who cares about that? We call that it's chain so distraction. Oh! <laughs> Boo. I have I been waiting that, to so, use that. I am totally going to use that from now. I'm sorry. I'm not even gonna give you credit, man. I'm just gonna yeah. start using that. <laughs> no, do it. Sadi's shot me down on using that like ten times, so I was just like, "We're doing it. We're going live." 
All right. In the last uh, in the last few minutes, um, just uh, for the for the everyone in the audience, um, get us hyped. What's coming up with our project? Um, Roland, give us a quick overview. What's coming up next uh, on the Gorg side? Uh, and then Burnt, take us to church and close us out. Tell us what's next oh. for uh, coming up for Zion. Orchestration Core launching with Upgrade 16, probably in the, within the next four weeks, hopefully sooner than that. Um, and that will be the first time that the Agoric chain allows orchestration contracts to deploy. If you're somebody that sees a problem composing across networks or even just stringing together multiple operations and sees an opportunity there, you could be building now. And by the time you're ready to deploy, it will be, it will be able to deploy on Agoric chain. And uh, yeah, that, that's what I'm excited about. Hell yeah. Dude, I'm honestly so excited for that, too. I'll be honest. Uh, you know, it's funny. We've been talking for a while, um, and, I, and I think I, I, I miss you guys every time because I'm, like, in and out of New York. But we've been talking orchestration for a while, and it's, like, genuinely awesome to have this conversation. Um, but, I mean, for us, um, mainnet coming extremely, extremely soon. Uh, obviously, a, a, a big launch with that. Uh, we have a ton of projects that have been on testnet uh, that are coming live on mainnet. Um, super, super excited for that. Um, and I would say that all of our efforts are, I mean, all of our efforts are coming to mainnet. And so I think today we just announced with Landslide, uh, you know, they're bringing IBC over to AVAX. And so with that kind of coming chain extraction uh, to AVAX, uh, you know, last week we did BNB, week before with Saga, and I get that mixed up and then injected before that. Um, so, I mean, keep on the horizon for, for kind of new, new things there, new experiences that'll be going to come out of that. So, we're super freaking excited. Um, and I'll see you guys in Austin. So Hell yeah. That'll be fun. That's right. Um, yeah, anyone who's coming out to Consensus, uh, Zion, Agoric, DCF, Near, Particle Network, Union, um, and a list of other sponsors that keeps on growing because everyone is so excited about Chain Abstraction. Um, we're all getting together to host a, a big uh, abstraction event in Austin called Abstract Austin. Um yeah, it's going to be dope. It's going to be like this space, but bigger, longer, wider, huger, better, and more food. Um, yeah, we'll drop uh, we'll drop links to that on our respective socials. But super excited to hear about what's coming up, uh, you know, like uh, Zion moving projects to mainnet. Love to hear about that. We're going to keep tabs on that. Definitely talk to you guys as more stuff happens. Roland, thank you so much for the product update. Orchestration Core coming soon. And uh, shortly after that, the Orchestration API will be released. So if you're someone who's building in the cross-chain space and you want to get started, feel free to reach out to either of our teams. And, uh, yeah, let us uh, let us know. And um, we're – oh, yeah, that's right. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Sonny, for the back channel. Abstract Austin, May 29th, 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. Uh, yeah, make sure you uh, clear your calendars. You're going to want to be there. And... Will it be recorded and live streamed for the people back home? Oh, yeah. It will be. Hell I'll be yeah. live streaming it. I'll be live streaming it myself, uh, walking around uh, on, in the event. So, uh, be sure to be sure and to say hi. Roland, 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 Nance. I mean, they just these guys just messaged me and said, uh, you know, whoever suggests the most disgusting shot uh, of alcohol, we'll, we'll take it, and whoever gets the most likes, we'll uh, we'll take that shot and live stream it. So, well, yeah, I mean, uh, that was what Anthony and Roland just said. I didn't make these rules, but yeah, Santi said he would take mine on my behalf because I, I can't make it yeah, to yeah, Austin. Yeah. So, I think Santi yeah. just said he'll take three, but that's fine. All right, pickleback shots in Austin. It's going Let's down. Go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Stay tuned. We'll have the recording up for this posted shortly. Thank you, Burnt. This was awesome. Yeah, this was a lot of fun. Thanks, guys.